The civil rights movement of the 1960s offers a unique opportunity to explore communication theory. Certainly themes of ethics, persuasion, and rhetoric all surfaced during the struggle for racial equality and equal opportunity. Here in Greensboro, the efforts of the Greensboro Four and other African American men who took part in the Woolworth sit-ins are often credited with setting the stage for this era of social protest and activism. Yet often overlooked is the fact that a number of African American women also participated on the local levels to organize grassroots support for civil rights goals and objectives. They marched, they protested, they too spent time in jail. Through their courage and persistence, the women were often able to transcend societal boundaries imposed by gender and class and emerge as leaders in their own right. To this end, they sought to increase opportunities not only for themselves, but for all people. This film project is a collection of oral histories with four Greensboro women who played a pivotal part in this chapter of the city's history. Their examples of organizational strategy and participation help us to better understand this period and sheds light on how each woman has emerged into a community leader today. Claudette Burroughs White, now a Greensboro City Councilwoman, was one of only four African American students attending Women's College, now UNCG, in the early 1960s at the height of the movement. She recalls her experiences at Women's College, reminisces about her friendship with Franklin McCain, one of the Greensboro Four, and reflects on how her experiences during that time have impacted her ongoing community involvement. Because one of the uh, feelings you have uh, or that I had uh, in uh, 57 throughout my college years was that when I would be around my friends, that everybody knew about A&T and Bennett mm -hmm. and uh, Howard, right. but nobody knew about women's college, you know, and so, uh, um, you know, it made me feel isolated because I was a part of that school rather than a part of the schools that were so well known among my African American friends. But I'm, certainly a person who believes that women hold up the world. Sure. And I, I personally believe that uh, probably the greatest planning and imagination and creation and creativity that went into this probably came from women. And, um, you know, I think the, um, and even Franklin, I tease Franklin McCain right now because his wife was right there at Bennett. And, I always tease them and say, you know, you just beat them to the punch because they were coming to, it was just a matter of who got downtown first. So in order to change and really impact or to have the greatest impact, you need to be at the table with the folks that make the decisions right. about your life. That's so that's, that's how I got uh, interested in politics because everybody's always sitting somewhere in the room deciding what's going to happen to that's you. True. And uh, so, uh, and that if, in fact, you really wanted to change the world, that was a great place to try to get to. So that's kind of what, you know, moved me to where I am right now. And, and uh, I'm a grassroots person, grassroots community. I know people. As a social worker, I learned to listen and to understand and to appreciate where people and their problems were. And so here I am. Right. And I think that um, if there's any strength to what I bring to uh, my job as a councilwoman, it's just having a a good feel for the community, knowing a lot of people, and hopefully being a good listener, and so that when I get to these uh, tables where decisions are made, that I can really represent how people feel and, and uh, bring that kind of background experience to it. Because you see, many of us believe in the um, Bible that says God hadn't given us the spirit of fear, and that we were doing what we were called to do as a part of this entire movement. but. Um, and together, you know, see, we at our high school, I can remember um, our NAACP youth group and so forth, you know, we just, and the Angela Smiths who said to me, y'all, you just do what you want to do, but do it together. And that's the kind of way we had to do things, you know, it really made a difference. The organizational unity that Claudette Burroughs White speaks of permeated the black community during this era, and certainly women were instrumental in that revolution. Women understood that the barriers of injustice were fierce and that the struggle for equality would not be won in isolation or without their participation. At the center of the grassroots effort was Nettie Mae Code, a Greensboro native who played a key role in motivating and mobilizing people to action in the old Ashboro neighborhood on the outskirts of downtown. 
She reflects on the day-to-day -day challenge of the movement and how it affected those involved. The challenge brought about strength, it brought about change, it brought about struggle. It also brought about frustration. It also brought about uh, more people understanding what's happening to the black community. And it brought about resistance. Mm -hmm. And with resistance came speaking up, meetings. Um, it came understanding that these things were happening to people all over the South. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at this time, we began to hear about Martin Luther King mm -hmm. and, and about James Farmer and people who followed him. We began to hear about SNCC, mm -hmm. you know, sure. um, the labor movements, just so many different movements because of the uh, unrest around what is happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The decline in jobs, the decline in community. Um, and for this reason, I think uh, so many of us started collaborating and meeting and trying to look at ways that we could have a voice, we could address some of the problems. And I think the student involvement caused the adults in the community to get involved. Mm -hmm. And my involvement, actually, I think the, um, the sit-ins and the whole issue around segregated facilities and public places is what brought most of us out. It affected everybody. Uh, and I think just that, just the ability to be with other people and, and, and to be counted mm -hmm. and to be able to stand up, right. um, just stays with you. And it also lifts your spirit in that I am somebody. Sure. And, the, oh, there were just so many different movements all over the country. And we didn't have that instant replay of TV then right. like we do now. <laughs> Even though it was there, the news didn't flow like it, it does. Um, but what I did get from that was um, the knowledge that I had to stay involved. The significance of women's involvement in Greensboro's civil rights struggle becomes especially evident in the history of nearby Bennett College, North Carolina's only college for African American women. Bennett's president at the time, Dr. Willoughby Player, had a unique challenge. Not only did she want the young women to play an active role in marches and protests, but she also wanted to nurture their spirits and character. Historically, Bennett had always prided itself on being a training ground from which women leaders emerged. One such woman is Greensboro's Mayor Pro Tem, Yvonne Johnson. As a student at Bennett from 1960 to 1964, she knew her experience at the school then was preparing her for a life of leadership. The key was to find purposeful means of challenging the establishment while maintaining a sense of dignity. One of the most, one of the most important things I think I got from Bennett was not only how you carry yourself and how you present yourself, but um, how you do that courageously and on principles. It didn't mean that we didn't have downtime. It didn't mean that we didn't have social time. It didn't mean that we didn't have time just to laugh and have fun. But it meant that we had to embrace a greater purpose, uh, the purpose of why we were here, uh, what our particular gifts and talents were, and how we could use them to better this community in this world. Sometimes it's difficult in the civil rights movement for me to talk about Bennett and not talk about Auntie Anne, and I think it should be difficult for them not to talk, um, to talk about uh, the civil rights movement and have to include Bennett College because we were such an integral part of the planning, of the execution. Uh, we were there on the front line. I can remember a particular march downtown, and we got, we passed right beside Woolworths. I'm walking, going around to the Carolina Theater, and some um, heckler threw a knife. Uh, it kind of slid, so it wasn't like that, but it just slid this knife, and um, we're saying some ugly things, and I'm the football team from North Carolina A&T took care of that. 
So uh, while most of it was nonviolent, <laughs> there were little bits and bits and pieces that weren't so nonviolent. But um, we felt uh, a protection uh, with that uh, union to a, a large degree. It was very turbulent times. There were some very nasty people. And then there were some very wonderful people of all races. Mm -hmm. But I can remember not even, somebody asked me once, well, when, how did you decide to become a part? It was not like you sat down and you thought about it and made a conscious decision. It was there, you just, it was like we just embraced it. It was like you've been thirsty a long time, and here's some water, and you don't think about drinking. You don't think about pouring it in the glass, you just dive in. And I worked on committees with SNCC, and I worked um, on planning and so forth. And um, I can remember when the students from Bennett were arrested, many of them, and they were put um, out on um, Huffine Mill Road at what was the old polio hospital. And there were no bars on the doors or any of that. And, we sang, they sang all night long and, and uh, just had the uh, sheriff's department pleading with the students, please, please let us get some rest. And, and I will say that they were courteous. They were not um, uh, mean or um, unprofessional or any of that. But I can remember Dr. Player standing up saying, if I have to give out diplomas in jail, mm -hmm. I will. Um, there was so much energy, there was so much um, unity, there was so much um, commitment and single, a single vision, um, a single goal, um, that it was just awesome. It was, it was such a um, powerful movement, it was well organized. Uh, if you think about the times and uh, how scary mm -hmm. and um, how vulnerable we could have been, or were perhaps, uh, and to do what we did and to have the success and to have, to have had made a tidal wave that moved all, not all over this country, uh -huh. but all over the world, and, and has still um, been an influence in the world, if you, to, wit, mm -hmm. to witness China, to, you know, and, yeah. and just many other places. So, uh, I'm, I was just blessed to have been a part of it and uh, learned a lot, and I think uh, it, it certainly um, nourished our characters. Born in Alabama in 1911 to educated professional parents, Ida Jenkins moved to Greensboro in 1934. She taught U.S. history at Dudley High School from 1949 to 1970, and then at North Carolina A&T until her retirement. As an educator, her role was to prepare students to be academically competitive should integration ever take place. They were, and it did. Three of the young men she taught were among the Greensboro Four. Though teaching school children was important to her, Ida Jenkins' participation in the NAACP also prepared her for the challenges of the movement. The NAACP was known for emphasizing group-centered leadership, incorporating both men and women into the decision-making processes. The perspective Jenkins provides is tremendous, having witnessed almost 70 years of change in Greensboro. She has received almost every honor that the city bestows and remains involved with numerous educational and civic organizations. At age 91, she is able to see how Greensboro's community has come full circle, and yet she also reminds us that we have so much work still left to do. Now, the only thing that I worked with in an organized manner relative to segregation was NAACP. Okay. I worked with the NAACP. As a matter of fact, one of those plaques out there is, they named me Woman of the Year. Uh -huh. And um, I worked very closely with them because my father was a member of the NAACP. You see, NAACP was a very old, old organization. I think it was organized in 1909, 1909. And my father worked with it even there in Alabama. Oh, they had the NAACP having a great problem with that. But um, they, it seemed uh, an organized thing that you could work with. Now, I had other experiences where I did things with one or two people, but with a big organized group, that was the only real 
organized group that I work with. I believe that the future looks bright for those of, those of us who are willing to jump on the bandwagon now and take advantage because September the 11th taught us a lesson and the president has tried to tell us we've got to get together. We cannot fight each other and everybody else too because keeping people down in a community, you're using your energy that you need to be using trying to keep other people from overwhelming us. We have a philosophy. We are democratic. And there are people who object to that. That was a wrong, that was a problem with the Twin Towers. This Otto had been taught, you know, that this is wrong. They don't need all of that. And they don't believe in in getting all those kind of things. And I believe the future to me for young people looks bright if they are willing to take advantage. And that's why I give them that, uh, it's not a poem, but that write up on uh, attitude. Because I tell them every day, I not only tell them, I tell adults, I don't care where you are thrust, what happens to you, or what you are doing, or what you plan to do. The attitude that you take with you to that situation determines whether or not you are going to be happy or unhappy, a success or a failure. The strength and experiences of each of these women gives voices to those who have sought to challenge the status quo and transform society. From a communication standpoint, examining their strategies of activism offers insight and challenges our thinking from both a political and a gendered context. The diligence of these women, their persistence and unwillingness to waver, no matter how difficult the odds, certainly is a lesson to us all.